Αυτό είναι το podcast του Βαγγέλη για τα κινούμενα σχέδια. Του Βαγγέλη του ψευδού και όχι του ψελού της γνωστής βυζαντινής οικογένειας. Και το επεισόδιο αρχίζει τώρα. Greetings everyone, I am Vangelis Karadimas. I am a Greek animator to the animator. Uh, and this is my podcast uh, slash uh, vidcast I hold about animation, especially Greek animation. This is a special episode since this is one uh, in, in English language and I will try to speak as uh, little as possible in order not to ruin it. So I'm happy to announce that with me today is Martin Kiddy, he's the script writer of Saving Shakespeare, and with, uh, uh, without further ado, Martin, thank you for being uh, here with me today. Uh, you're w- uh, welcome to this uh, VidCast podcast, and uh, please tell us a few about uh, yourself. Thank you, Vangelis, uh, for having me. Hello to you, and hello to everyone who might be listening or watching. My name is Martin Keady. I am a writer and among my major works is Saving Shakespeare, a a biographical story of Shakespeare, which I've been developing as uh, an animated uh, series or show with Vangelis. Uh, As far as I know, you've dedicated a great part of your life studying Shakespeare, and I'm not talking about only the plays. Um, How did this occur and uh, what forms did this uh, dedication take? It's uh, it's a very good question and probably the most important question that I should ask myself, Vangelis. I have always been a great lover of Shakespeare and thinking back specifically, I really first became involved um, or or first read Shakespeare rather when I was about 12 or 13, about the age that most children are introduced to him at school around the world. And um, in particular, I remember I remember the first time I read Macbeth, which is my favourite play, and I will just say very briefly that I was reading it in a typical English autumnal evening where it was dark when I began reading it and by the time I finished reading it I looked up from the page and it was pitch black and somehow I must have been so gripped by reading the play I wouldn't have understood it all at that time or at that at that age obviously but it clearly had some effect on me and it's always I've always cited that as an example of Shakespeare's um complete and instant hold over me. I studied Shakespeare at the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon. I've subsequently written about Shakespeare in a wide variety of media, both fiction and non-fiction, and all of that work and research has really culminated in Saving Shakespeare, which I've written as a stage play, a screenplay, which would obviously include animation and other media, and even as a, what I call a sonic play, an audio, radio, or podcast play. The greatest stories can be told in any medium, I believe, and the story of Shakespeare's own life is one of those greatest, is one of the greatest stories. And what's remarkable is that there has never been a genuine biopic in the cinema or even a biodrama in um, the theatre about Shakespeare telling the full story of his life. It seems an extraordinary omission, but uh, there it is. It's hiding in plain sight, as it were, and it's a a gap or a vacuum that I hope to fill with Saving Shakespeare. So... um... Why is Shakespeare's life interesting? Um, I can say as uh, one who worked on your scripts and uh, as a a person who studied history and archaeology that I found a lot of things that are really interesting, but I guess that it is better to hear it from you. Well, put very simply, Shakespeare is the greatest dramatist who ever lived and 
I believe that his life was as dramatic as anything that he wrote. And it's relatively little known, even among so-called Shakespeareans, even among people I know in the Shakespeare academic and research community. There are remarkable things about his life that I believe directly shaped his writing. As with any writer, it's not a straight um, cause and effect. It's the what happened to Shakespeare in his actual life was then refracted, for want of a better better word, diffused or somehow redirected through his own genius. But there is also a direct or at least an indirect link to his own uh, life in almost all all of his writing. In the uh, in the story of Saving Shakespeare. I look at three main um, episodes or turning points in his life, which I believe correspond beautifully to the three main genres in which he wrote, comedy, history, and tragedy. The comedy is the first part of the story, which you know well, having um, adapted it as a, a comic or a graphic novel, which is available to read or see on my website the shakespeareplays.com we will All put one a word. link down in the description in the youtube terrific and it is just the shakespeareplays.com i always joke that shakespeare very foolishly didn't copyright or brand his name so i i swept in and stole it for my purposes the first part of the story is comedy which is how shakespeare and his fellow players stole a theater a whole theater facing eviction by a puritanical landlord who didn't like players or players. They resorted to taking the theatre apart, nail by nail, plank by plank, and transporting it across the, ro the frozen River Thames to a um, new site on the other side of the Thames, the southern side. And that theatre became the Globe, the theatre that uh, we know of today. The second part of the story is history, and it is the remarkable but true story of how Shakespeare and his fellow players became involved, unwittingly or otherwise, in a plot to overthrow the Queen, Elizabeth I. And the final part of the story is tragedy, which is the last six months of Shakespeare's life, when he had returned to Stratford-on-Avon, his hometown, and hoping to enjoy a peaceful and well-deserved retirement, he instead became involved into a tragedy of personal and family affairs that I believe contributed to his dying much earlier than he might have done otherwise. Comedy, history, tragedy, Shakespeare's three great genres. And it's it's almost a saying or a truism that Shakespeare reflects all human existence well what people forget is that his writing reflects his own existence his own his own life can be regarded as a shakespeare play or more accurately a series of plays a comedy a history and a tragedy um what fascinates me especially in uh, shakespeare's story is that uh, if he didn't have those dedicated friends, we would uh, probably not know him at all today. Or at least there would be a chance that uh, we would never heard of him. Absolutely, or or perhaps only partially, if I may say, Vangelis. It is, it is likely that without the help of his friends, who were his fellow players, in particular three, his leading man, Richard Burbage, and the two managers of his company, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, who were also players in addition to being company managers. Essentially, after Shakespeare died prematurely because of the tragic events of the last six months of his life, at that point, only half of his plays had ever really been properly printed that was because at the time, astonishing as it seems now, there was no copyright or intellectual property law, for want of a better term, that applied to plays. If you wrote a play and published it, anyone else could take it and put it on the stage without, um, without paying you or even acknowledging you properly. And that was why during his own life, Shakespeare 
didn't publish most of his plays. It was it would almost have been financially foolhardy to do so. Had he done so, it would be much easier for people to pirate his work. But after he died, his friends realized that after the man had died, the work might die soon afterwards as well. And I obviously don't want to want to give away the the whole story, but that is a vital part, um, an epilogue, as it were, to the whole story. Without his friends, there really wouldn't be the Shakespeare we know today. Only half of his works would have survived, and of those half, only a few of them were ever printed properly. They would have been garbled or even incomprehensible versions. And without the help of his friends, who were so dedicated to him, Shakespeare would be at best half the Shakespeare we know today. He was cer- he would certainly not be regarded as the transcend trans transcendent universal genius of all art that he is almost universally regarded as today. Okay, now let's move to another part. I have to compliment the Greek audience of uh, this. Uh, of course. Uh, how was Shakespeare related to Greece, or to put it better, because Greece was not a state back then, how was he related to Greeks, ancient or uh, temporarily, as uh, he was, as his time? Well, in Shakespeare's time, the people of the rest of Europe, especially the more educated part of society, and Shakespeare was at least initially among that more educated part of society, they were much more intimately involved with ancient Greece and Rome, the classical world, than we are today, than we could ever imagine of being today. Obviously, the uh, the Renaissance, the discovery of, of printing, or rather the development of printing in Europe, and the discovery of many of the ancient Greek and Roman plays in the century or so before his um, before his um, birth, plays that were then translated into other languages, including English, it gave Shakespeare and other writers of his time this incredible resource that had almost been lost to, uh, certainly to Western Europe, for, for the better part of a millennium, for the better part of a thousand years. He would have studied both Latin and Greek as a schoolboy, and that's absolutely vital to emphasize um, his his close contemporary and probably the most famous other writer of his period, Ben Jonson, was quoted and has been quoted widely as saying Shakespeare knew little Latin and no Greek. That is almost certainly untrue. Jonson himself was a self-educated man who largely taught himself the works of Rome and Greece, and he may have even subconsciously looked down on on Shakespeare or resented the classroom, the school learning that he'd had. But there is no doubt that Shakespeare's, quote, little Latin and no Greek, unquote, would have been probably comparable to that of, of, say, a student studying classics, Greece and Rome, in, in a university in the 21st century. He would have had this resource to draw on. And... Greece is there throughout all of his work and all of his writing. The most obvious example is the very the many close comparisons between Hamlet, arguably his greatest play, and um, the Orestes, Orestes by Aeschylus. Enormous, enormous comparisons between the two. A a king who kills um, a king rather who is killed by a relative the repercussions for the other surviving members, even down to the importance of friends. In many ways, Orestes must have been an influence on Hamlet. In addition, Shakespeare sets plays, two of his plays in Greece. People know of Time and of Athens. The the title is obviously a giveaway, but what people often forget is that A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is often described as the, the sort of quintessential English play or the English summertime play, it's often performed in England in summertime, is actually set in Greece. Greece, like Italy, and he wrote, he wrote about, um, he wrote plays that were set in Italy, obviously, notably, 
Othello and uh, the Merchant of Venice, they were imaginative spaces for him, imaginative working and playing spaces. They were always there in his imagination. And so the influence of ancient of the ancient world of Rome and Greece, which, as I say, had really only been rediscovered in the century before his birth, they were absolutely vital influences on him, probably the most important influences on him. Ah, okay. Now another question, more a bit more personal. I remember mm. I was surprised to get an email from an English uh, fellow asking me to uh, if I can animate it, his uh, if I, yeah, I can animate uh, his uh, scripts, and it was you uh, asking me to animate uh, Saving Shakespeare. It uh, it is not something common to have. <laughs> A British person to ask a Greek uh, working on an animated series based on his script. What was the issue there? What happened? Well, in the first instance, Vangelis, it was that you had expressed an interest in my work. You said that you yourself were a um, a lover of Shakespeare, and and if you may remember, it goes back a number of years now to that almost long ago, far away mythical world of the pandemic when we like many creative people in different areas contacted you know we met online or e-met as it were because we weren't able to meet people physically at the time uh, you expressed an interest in my work we initially worked on uh, the idea that we initially worked on if you remember was um, a much broader um, a broader story it was called bedtime stories by the greatest storytellers um, which is there in the back pocket, as it were, for the future after Saving Shakespeare. Shakespeare was just one of a number of stories that were literally the great or half a dozen of the greatest authors who'd ever lived from Homer to Shakespeare to Jane Austen to Dickens. And the story was um, or, the, or the setting or the format was that those great writers would, like any parent, have told their children bedtime stories. And the Shakespeare story that I had him telling his children was the story of how he and his fellow players had stolen a theatre. And so Sa Saving Shakespeare directly evolved and developed from the bedtime stories by the Greatest Storytellers series. That was always my greatest interest and thankfully you were interested in it too and that's what has led us to working together um so i don't have any any other questions to ask you is there something that you would like to add in this conversation i would just re-emphasize if i may vangelis the point i made probably right at the beginning that um Remarkable as it sounds, there has never been a single dramatic work that tells the full story of Shakespeare from childhood to death and beyond. There has never been a full biographical play. There has never been a genuine biopic. Shakespeare in Love was terrific, but it was a complete fantasy and obviously only fantas uh, only focused rather on a particular life. It's obviously a bold and ambitious task to try and tell the story of Shakespeare in a single dramatic work. One, if I may say, that is almost worthy of Shakespeare himself. Um, in in his absence or in his um, given his inability to do so, which was um, a a partly because he died prematurely and b because at the time he would never have thought or believed that his own story was worth telling that's what i've set out to do and as i've also said earlier i do genuinely believe that the greatest stories can be told in any medium from a stage to a screen to a podcast to an animated series to a graphic novel and that's what I'm trying to do. Obviously, we're still trying to develop the animated series. You have very kindly and very ably um, turned the first part of the story, the comedy story in which they steal a theatre into the um, graphic novel, which I repeat is available for people to read or see at my website, theshakespeareplays.com. 
I'm also working towards a full production of a stage play next year. In my wildest dreams, it would it would be performed, or at least part of it would be performed at the opening of the um, new Shakespeare Museum in uh, Shoreditch, East London, which is where Shakespeare was originally based before he moved to the globe. I'm still in discussions with the Shakespeare Museum and remain hopeful. I also hope to do a um, to produce a sonic version, an audio radio podcast version. It's it's um, it's almost war or at least a campaign on all fronts. I I love this story. I think it's a story that needs to be told, a story that explains why the greatest writer who ever lived became the greatest writer who ever lived. And that's the story that I want to tell. Okay, so a few words from me now as a conclusion. In a month or in a month or so, I will start a crowdfunding campaign in Kickstarter. Uh, there will be a link in uh, my web uh, page, vktunes.com, uh, go uh, sending uh, the visitor there. Uh, it will be about starting a 2D animation studio here in Athens, Greece. Starting a studio in Greece is something more difficult than doing it uh, in other countries. Um, and uh, this, in, in case I manage to uh, create a studio, I will be able to easily, more easy, uh, find, uh, find uh, funds about uh, my projects. And obviously, saving Shakespeare will be among them. And uh, although my main target group are the Greek folks and uh, Greek companies, I would uh, gladly accept uh, backers from uh, uh, British uh, area. And um, especially since I have in mind um, um, do some work on uh, the British history and especially the ancient history of uh, Britain. I won't say something more now, but uh, anyway, if someone decides to back the campaign, that might help him do it in a more enthusiastic way. Uh, I think that I should leave the uh, final word to you now, Martin, to close this uh, session. Well, Literally off the back of what you have just said, uh, Vangelis, I would make this pitch to any potential sponsor or supporter. My ambition is to tell, for the first time ever really in any medium, the story of Shakespeare's remarkable life. For any would-be producer or promoter or sponsor, this is your opportunity to tell, to help us tell, for the first time ever, the remarkable true story of undoubtedly the greatest writer who ever lived, arguably the greatest artist in any medium who ever lived, and quite possibly the greatest human being who ever lived. And I hope that would be a source of interest, if not compulsion, for uh, any potential sponsors or supporters. Once again, thank you for this conversation, uh, Martin. And I would also like to help everyone who watched this podcast, Salas uh, Vidcast. And uh, I will see you soon in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vangelis. And bye-bye to you and everyone. Ήταν Ζάχαρη και Μέλη αυτό το podcast του Βαγγέλη. Περιμένουμε τη γνώμη σας στα σχόλια μαζί με τις ερωτήσεις σας. Νέο ραντεβού περίπου σε δύο εβδομάδες. Μουσική